So if you're a bit like me, your brain might be a bit mushy after the new year and you need a little bit of help to get back up to speed with coding. So that's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to do some JavaScript exercises and if you've been on the channel before, you should know the deal. But basically, I'm going to give you a JavaScript exercise to complete and you can pause the video and have a go at it yourself and then we'll run through some solutions together. And all of today's challenges or exercises are going to be from Edibit, so you can get yourself a free account to follow along and I'll put a link to all of the exercises in the description below. So let's make a start with our first exercise. So the first exercise I've picked out for us is this one about functions and it's quite an interesting one because it just gives you a bit of insight to how JavaScript works and how you can pass functions around as arguments. But basically what you're going to need to do is get a function written up that actually accepts two arguments, uh, which are functions themselves, and then evaluates which one actually returns the largest value, and then return the name of the variable argument, uh, depending on which one is larger. So the first argument is referred to as f, and the second one is g. And if the values are the same, uh, then we return the value of neither from the function. So let's go over to the code and have a look at that. So just to demonstrate, this is the function, and you've got the two arguments of f and g. So you need to work out which one returns the largest value and then return that name of the function as a string. So pause the video if you like and have a go at this one. It's fairly straightforward, but it's actually got some interesting things which we'll talk about in just a moment. Okay, so let's have a look at some solutions for this which is larger function. So the first thing we're going to want to do is actually call the functions that have been passed in in the variables of f and g and work out which one has got the larger value. So I'm going to do that by creating two variables inside of here. Uh, and one is the first one's going to be f result, and that's just a call to the f function. And to call it, it is just a function. Uh, we can just put the parentheses after the argument name. And we do the same thing with the g result as well. So we're going to call that g function, and then whatever that function returns will be then stored into these variable names. So if in the examples, uh, the functions return values like 5 and 10. So those will be the values that are stored into these two variables here. And then once we actually know what the value is that's been returned from each of those functions, it's pretty easy to work out which one has got the larger value. So I'm going to use a ternary operator here to basically check which one has given us the larger value. So for example, if the f result is bigger than the g result, then I'm going to return the value of f as a string, a singular character. And then if it's not larger, then the g result must have given us the larger value, so I'm just going to return the value of g. And that's pretty much all we need to do, and if we run the uh, tests, you'll find that most of them do actually pass for this, but we haven't actually taken into consideration the values uh, that are equal. So you can see these two tests here have failed. Uh, so we need to put a check in to see if the values are actually the same. So we could extend this ternary operator here to do a check if the values are the same but I don't like using nested ternary operators they start to get a bit messy and a bit unreadable so I'm going to put an if statement in here to actually check if the values are equal so we'll say if the f result is exactly equal to the g result then we're just going to return that string of neither and that just exits the function early for us as well, and we don't have to worry about anything else after that in the ternary operator. So let's do the checks again, and we should find that they all pass this time. And they indeed do, and we've got the all of the tests passing. And that is a sim really simple solution for this function, and I think it's probably the cleanest and most elegant solution for this as well. We could actually try and access the function names uh, as the uh, arguments that have been passed into this function uh, and try and get the name of it to actually return as a string. But because these are pa actually passed in in the instructions here, in the examples, as anonymous functions, as arrow functions, they won't actually have a name. So we're relying on the actual name of the uh, argument up here uh, to actually turn the string of f or g, so there's no real way around that. We can't work out what the function name is uh, other than looking at uh, which one has given us the larger result. Uh, one other thing that might be worth doing just to tidy this up is to actually check that these values that are passed in to f and g as the arguments are actually functions, because if they're not, if we actually try and call 
uh, the function when it's actually a string, then we are going to run into some problems. Although it's not actually within the scope of the actual exercise, we might want to check the type of the uh, arguments have been passed in just double check that they're actually functions as well. So that is something that we could do to actually extend and improve this function, but it's not required to actually pass the challenge. So that's the first exercise uh, covered. Let's go and move on to the next one. And this one caught my eye simply because uh, it doesn't actually tell you what you need to do. <laughs> so you really have to kind of think about what uh, or, or know the sort of JavaScript features that you could use and be aware of like things that you can do with the language to actually work this one out. Uh, but essentially, uh, it gives you two arguments into the crazy function, and you need to work out uh, what the value is, uh, but it doesn't give you any uh, information about how to do that, apart from one little hint, which is talking about the tags, and the ta main tag that you want to really look at is the bitwise operations, or the bit operations as it's called there, and uh, if you're having a go at this exercise, just think of the different types of bitwise operations that you can apply to numbers uh, in JavaScript and maybe do a bit of a Google search uh, if you're not sure what those are, because uh, that will give you the uh, information that you need to actually work out how to do the crazy function. So pause the video if you like and have a go at this one, and we'll be back in just a moment to have a look at some examples or the example of how to actually complete this exercise. Okay, so let's have a look at the crazy function exercise now. So uh, as mentioned, it doesn't give you any information about how to actually uh, complete this, but essentially you need to kind of return a value based on these two uh, bits of information that have been passed in. So uh, in the examples, it gives us 10 and 20 and gives us 30, and it's given us the hint that it's going to be a bitwise operation. So I'm just going to go over to the console here to kind of demonstrate how we could maybe do that. So it's not actually a bitwise operation, but with the first example, you get the right answer if you add 10 and 20 together. But obviously the second one, it kind of falls down. Uh, 17 and 35 is not uh, 52, uh, or it's not the expected result for the uh, example that's been given. So we need to use a different type of operator to get the result. And there are various different bitwise operators that you can use uh, to basically analyze the bits, uh, the, the ones and zeros at different positions uh, for each of the numbers and the first one we're going to look, take a look at is the bitwise and operator so uh, this checks if the bits in the same positions are actually the same so 10 and 20 notice it's not a double ampersand there it's just a single one and you can see that gives us a value of 0 and 17 and 35 gives us a value of 1 so it's obviously not the right operator that we need to use and that's the key to this uh, completing this challenge is basically just to try different things. Um, but to save you going through pretty much every bitwise operator that there is, the next one you might come across anyway is the uh, exclusive or operator, which is a, a caret symbol. So uh, if we do 10 and 20, uh, that does give us the value of 30. So we're basically checking the bits in each position and checking if either of them are actually uh, to switch to one. Uh, and then you'll see when we go to uh, 17 and then exclusive or 35, that also gives us the value of 50. And just double check the last one, uh, 233, you can see it gives us the right answer. So that is the bitwise operation that is needed to complete this challenge. Uh, so well done if you figured that out. Uh, as I say, it is just a bit of trial and error, but I quite like these kind of exercises where you don't know how to actually do the implementation for them. Um, so let's go over to the code and finish this function. So we'll say return a and then caret or exclusive or b. And running the tests, we should find that they all pass for us which indeed they all do. And there's not much that we can do to actually improve this function because it's just simply returning a value. We could convert it into an arrow function if that was appropriate for our use case. Um, but I'm just going to leave it there for this exercise because that has passed all of the tests. Let's move on to the next exercise. And this one is part of a series. I haven't looked at the other ones, but this one is all about, um, it's given us more of a scenario to read through. So I'll just give you a brief overview and let you know what it is that you need to do. So I guess basically a burglary has occurred and you're trying to claim your insurance. So you're given an object, which is basically a list of things that have been stolen in this burglary. And the keys of the object are the names of the items that have been stolen, 
which is kind of irrelevant really, we don't really need to know that, because what we want to do is work out the value of each of the items that have been stolen and see if that's more than the uh, insurance policy's excess or limit, for example. So in this example here, you can see that uh, the baseball bat was worth $20 or whatever, and the uh, insurance limit was $5, so that gives us a resulting value of 15. So basically you need to take 20 away from 15, which is fine for this one, but then it gets a little bit more complicated because there are multiple items and you need to work out uh, the total of that and then subtract the limit from it. So there's a little hack that will make this function quite easy for us, uh, but if you want to have a go at this now, uh, pause the video and have, have a go at the calculate difference exercise and then return in a minute and we'll have a look at how to solve it. Okay, so let's go and have a go at this one. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward really. Uh, let's go to the code. And as mentioned, we want to basically take the object that's passed in as the first argument here and work out the total amount of things that have been stolen, uh, the total value, and then actually uh, return that with the limit subtracted, so what the difference is between the two things. So to actually get that uh, total amount, what I'm going to do is going to say the total amount. It's going to, I'm going to store this in a variable because it will just make the function a little bit more easier to understand, although you could do this all on one line. And so to get the values that are stored inside this object, instead of looping through all of the keys and getting the values that correspond to them, I'm going to use the object.values function, which if we pass in the object, which is the first argument, that will give us all of the values uh, that have been passed in uh, to the function. So for example, this last one, it'll be 200, 200, and 1. And so we can just use that, uh, those values, which will be an array of those, those numbers, and then just reduce that into uh, an overall amount. So let's just call the reduce function on that. And it's just going to take the total and the value. So each item in that array that's been generated from object.values. And then we just simply say total plus value just to get the sum of that. And we just make sure we initialize total uh, with an initial value of zero. So now that total amount uh, is just all of the object properties, the values that are stored into there and reduced down into a sum of total amount. So that makes it really simple then to just say when we've got that total amount, we just need to subtract the limit from it. And that will give us the uh, difference between the limit and the total amount that's been uh, put, stolen in that particular burglary. So let's run those tests and see what happens. So you can see we've got all uh, those tests passing. And again, I don't think there's much that I would change on this function. As mentioned, you could put this all into a one-liner on an arrow function if you uh, just uh, don't uh, store the intermediary uh, amount here. But I do think it makes it a bit more readable to have that variable there so that you can uh, keep track of what's going on. And if you needed to do any further processing, uh, with that value as well, then it's available for you to do that. So I hope you got on okay with that one. Let's have a look at the final uh, exercise that we've got today, uh, which is all about error messages. And it's a pretty simple task that's being asked for you to do here. Essentially, you're just given a value, uh, a number, which is in between the range of one to five, and all you need to do really is return a string which corresponds to the number that's been passed in. So if the number is 1, for example, we need to return a string of check the fan, uh, colon e1, error 1, I guess. And likewise for the numbers, we return the relevant error. So there's no real clever way to construct the strings for this because each error message is pretty different from each other. And as a, an additional challenge uh, or requirement for this exercise, you shouldn't really use switch or if statements uh, to uh, work out what the error message is. So if you're thinking of doing a switch statement for this one, uh, try and think of a different approach uh, to actually getting uh, the error codes. It does say that you can use the if statement for returning uh, any other values, uh, which needs to be returned as uh, 101, the code of 101. Um, so you can use one there, but try and think of different ways that you can do this without using switch or if statements. So again, last one, pause the video if you like and have a go at this one. And we'll come back in a few moments just to go through this final exercise and a possible solution. Okay, so let's have a go at this one. And uh, what I'm gonna do to 
speed things up for us a little bit here and make sure I don't make any typos is just to copy these error messages uh, before we go over to the code. And uh, hopefully you came up with a solution for this one, but the simple way to uh, not use a switch statement or an if statement here, and I think is actually probably more efficient, is to put the error messages into an object with the keys being the number of what you're looking for. Now you could do this via an array if you want as well, but I think an object is better, and I'll explain why in just a second. Uh, but just to show you what I mean, uh, let's create a new variable inside here of error codes and let's paste that text into there. Uh, you could provide uh, error codes, this, this uh, object here, as a, an additional argument into the function to make it a bit more flexible, but we can't do that with the challenge because the challenge uh, won't know what the, uh, the, ver uh, the argument is that we passed in. Uh, but essentially this is what I mean by putting the keys as the numbers. So uh, put in the value of one there, uh, two, and three, four, and five. And let's make sure we've got some commas in there too. So there we go, there we've got our error codes object. So now we have an object set up where the uh, key is the error code number, and then obviously the value is the message. And I've missed out some double quotes here. Probably got a bit too aggressive with the deleting there. Um, and once we're in that position, we know the error code number from the uh, arguments passed in here. So we just return uh, the uh, error code. And then using square bracket notation, we can access the key uh, via that number that's been passed in. So if we run the tests now, uh, we should find that the majority of them pass. A few won't. Uh, well, just the one at the bottom doesn't. And I'll explain why that doesn't in a minute. But to illustrate why an object is better than an array is because we could have done the same thing just by accessing the array at the uh, various index positions. We have to subtract one because we, the array will be zero index. But what happens if we have error codes that have strings in them as well? So for example, you might have a, a, an error code that is um, uh, emergency or something like that. And it's just got a string of emergency, for example. The, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that in an array because you wouldn't be able to put emergency in as uh, an index name. So using a, an object makes it a bit more flexible uh, if we were to change the way the uh, the n value, the, uh, the error code number, is passed in. So what about this uh, last test here? Uh, so we're expecting 101 for the last one because it's obviously passed in a value like 6 or something that's not actually in the uh, uh, error codes object. So you could uh, just put in an if statement. It did say it was okay to do that. So if n is not in uh, any of the keys here, uh, then you could obviously uh, just uh, return that 101 value instead. But you'll notice that the value we're actually getting is undefined. Now, undefined will be falsy in JavaScript. So we can actually use an or operator to say, uh, to move on to the next available option if error codes square bracket n is actually falsy. So that would look a little bit like something like this. So we could say, if error codes gives us a, a value back, so if it's either one, two, three, four, five, or even emergency, we're going to return that value. But if that's undefined, if it's something that's not in the object, then we'll just move on to the next uh, part of the statement, which will return 101. And if we just check that again, we should get a little ding and say that everything is complete. Uh, which indeed we do. And that's a good solution for this exercise. I think we could do a few things like change it into an arrow function and as I mentioned, pass in the error codes object as an argument to this, just to make it a bit more flexible. However, I think it uh, satisfies this exercise uh, and uh, I don't think there's anything we can really improve on with that. So those are just some basic JavaScript exercises, but hopefully you find it useful to get the old brain working again. I know I find it useful just to go through some of these exercises and think about how to approach problems and the different edge cases that come up and how to write better code. And if you're interested in doing some more exercises, then you should check out these next videos where we go through beginner exercises all the way through to more intermediate and advanced ones.